to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the lord's death until he comes. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 26. We welcome you to our study of the book of 1 Corinthians. Today we're going to be studying 1 Corinthians chapters 11 and 12, and we're so glad that you joined us for our broadcast today. As always, we want to encourage you to locate your Bible, have it handy, as we're going to be looking to the Word of God as our final authority today. Friend, we want you to know that today's lessons are being brought to you by individuals and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly, whether that be on Sunday or Wednesday. You'd be an honored guest. They'd be happy to have you. If you've got Bible questions or you'd like to study more about the Word of God, they'd love to sit down and discuss that with you. And friend, here at the Gospel of Christ, we want you to know our emphasis and our motive in bringing these lessons is because we're concerned about people's souls. We love people's souls and we want men and women to go to heaven. And if there is any way we can help you spiritually, friend, we want to do that as well. We encourage you to visit our website. That location is thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our Bible study material. We have transcripts, study questions, CDs, DVDs, digital downloads, and the good news is all of it is free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether that be on CD or DVD, we'd be happy to make that to, available to you free of charge. You can go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and from there, you can fill out a media request form, or you can call us or write us at the information given during our program. And friend, for the way phones and iPhones and Android phones are going today, the way the world is working with smartphones, we want you to know as well that we have apps available for both the Android and the iPhone as well through the uh, app stores, and that's a great way to study God's Word on the go as well. Today we're going to be thinking about Paul's discussion of basically two ideas. In 1 Corinthians 11, he's going to discuss in great detail about the Lord's Supper. Then in 1 Corinthians 12, he's going to begin to discuss about spiritual gifts and pick up more of that in chapters 13 and 14. And so we hope that you got your Bible ready and that you'll turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 with us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, about verse number 20 following, we're going to think about today the Lord's Supper. And just as some background to that, in Matthew chapter 26, as Jesus took the Passover with his disciples, which was a Jewish holiday, uh, a Jewish uh, law and holiday of that time, Jesus in that context began to institute and prepared his disciples for taking the Lord's Supper in the kingdom. That is, when the church began. We know that they were prepared to do that in Matthew 26. And we also learn from passages like Acts 20, verse 7, and 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2, and chapter 11, that they came together on the first day of the week as the church. To do that. Now, let's notice what this context teaches, and then we'll go, to, go back and notice some principles about that. Look in 1 Corinthians 11. Let's read verse 20 following. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. It should have been, but it wasn't. Now, notice verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty both of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Friend, as we're thinking about this idea, we're reminded of the importance of uh, the Lord's Supper. And we're reminded of how this ought to be a reverent action, a reverent part of our worship. That is, it's reverent in its purpose. This is not just some common meal. Paul said in verse 20, uh, this is a problem I've got with you. When you gather together, you're gathering together as it were to eat a common meal and not to take the Lord's Supper properly. And so when we think about this idea, we want it to be reverent in purpose. That is, we're coming together as the body of Christ to remember the Lord's death. And this is a, a, a sacred and important part of worship. In the Lord's Supper, do we realize that we're worshiping God? God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. This is a way that we are honoring and magnifying, showing our appreciation and praise before God. This is a way that we're exalting the Savior. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57 says, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're reminded of that victory. We're reminded of how awesome it is to be a Christian <clears throat> and how thankful we are for what the Lord's done. <clears throat> In 1 Corinthians, we also learn uh, about the Lord's death and how we proclaim it till He comes. And this is an opportunity for us to be reverent about His death. 1 Peter 2.24 reminds us that the Lord Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. He gave His life as a sacrifice for me. When Jesus went to the cross, and when He bore our sins in His own body, friend, He bore my sins in his own body. This is an opportunity to be reverent as I worship the Lord and as I think about his death on the cross. But you know, it's also an opportunity to show reverence for others as we participate together in the Lord's Supper. Notice what verse 21 says in 1 Corinthians 11. Here was the problem they had in Corinth. He says, for in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. One is hungry and another is drunk. As we said, they had a problem. They were looking at this as a common meal. They weren't waiting on one another. One is already eaten. Somebody else gets there. and they've not, they've not shown proper reverence toward God or toward other people. Can you imagine the chaos this must have been in the first century? Well, friend, this teaches us that during the taking of the Lord's Supper, we need to have reverence for others also. This is not a place for uh, joking or talking, writing notes, laughing. This is not an opportunity to be playing or daydreaming or, or thinking about what you're going to be doing the rest of the week or, or goofing off. I want to have reverence not only for God, but in reverence for God, I want to partake of the Lord's Supper in such a way that we also have reverence for other people. That is, I don't want to do anything that's going to be such a distraction that that causes others not to be able to worship God correctly. But then as we think about the Lord's Supper, let's also notice the requirements that are given. There are certain requirements that are given in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that are necessary to partake of the Lord's Supper correctly. Now, let's notice for just a minute what those requirements are. Look with me, if you would, in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 through 25 again. What are those requirements? Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, 
on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Friend, in principle, there are requirements that God sets forth. And we learn that, that in principle, God expects us to follow his requirements. Does not the Bible teach that God wants me and you to do what he says? We, we find that throughout the scripture, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul said, These things I've transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that in us you may learn, listen now, not to think beyond what's written. 2 John 9 says, Whoever transgresses and goes beyond the doctrine of Christ, does not have God. We learn in Revelation 22, 18 and 19, we're not to add to nor to take away from the things written in the book. In Proverbs 30, verse 6, God said, do not add to his word lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. And so the basic principle that we find in scripture is that when God gives us a requirement, tells us there's something to do, in principle, God wants us to do exactly that. In fact, we find several occasions in the Bible when God told people something to do and they didn't do exactly that, that there were consequences, horrible consequences to that. A uh, couple of examples to mention. We find in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 and 2, that God told Nadab and Abihu uh, certain things to do and they offered an unauthorized fire to the Lord, which he had not commanded. And fire rained down from heaven upon them. We learn in the transporting the ark uh, in 1 Samuel 6, 1 Chronicles 15, uh, that God had told them a specific way of how to transport the ark. They put it on a new cart, which wasn't right. And people died because of that, and, and there were grave consequences. And so when God tells us something to do, God wants us to do that. Matthew 7, verse 21, Jesus said, it's not everybody that looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. But not only do we know about those requirements in principle, but we also see God gives requirements here that need to be put in place in practice. That is, there are requirements that are necessary for us to partake of the Lord's Supper correctly. What do we mean by that? In verses 23 and 24, there is the bread, which represents the broken body of Jesus. There is the cup, which we know from Matthew 26 and other passages is the fruit of the vine, and that represents the blood of the Lord. Friend, can we, can we really take the Lord's Supper correctly if we don't have the proper elements? If someone says, Ah, bread, that's so dry and dull. What if we had something better, hamburgers or pizza? Would that be okay? Or fruit of the vine, that's so outdated. What about Coca-Cola? Eh, friend, God specified. God told us the bread, the unleavened bread, represents the body of Jesus. The cup, the fruit of the vine, represents His blood. And we are to partake of that in remembrance of him. And so we see God's requirements in principle, we see God's requirements in practice, and we also see that in practicality. And that is, we're to do this in remembrance of him. As I partake of the bread, I think about the body of Jesus, and, and maybe even this might help. Sometimes one might read passages about what Jesus suffered, like in Isaiah 53, like in Psalm 22, uh, Matthew chapter 27, and that may help remind me of, of what Jesus suffered in the flesh. I think about the blood of Christ, and I think about that atoning sacrifice that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And then as we think about the Lord's Supper, let's also consider its regularity. That is, we learn from 1 Corinthians 11, 
and from other Bible passages that there was a regularity to the Lord's Supper. What do we mean by that? Notice again 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 26. Paul says, For as often, listen to that word, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. With the using of that word often, there's a connection to a certain timing. Uh, how often should Christians partake of the Lord's Supper? Does it even matter? And does the Bible give us any guidelines on this? Well, friend, we do find an oftenness here. And we do find from the early church how often they were gathering. And that serves as a great pattern for us today. The Bible teaches, or we find the example in the book of Acts of the early church, Christians coming together on the first day of the week. I want you to look in your Bible with me, or notice with me, Acts chapter 20, verse number 7. As we think about the oftenness of the Lord's Supper, we notice from Acts chapter 20, verse 7, these words. Now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. The disciples in the first century, the Lord's followers, the, the, the New Testament church, living under the guidance of the apostles, they came together on the first day of the week to break bread. Now, I want you to pause and think about for just a moment that phraseology, first day of the week, and how that would include every first day of the week. Let me illustrate that from the way the Bible uses that language. Let's use an example from the Sabbath. How often did God's people remember the Sabbath? Well, friend, we know every Saturday that rolled around, they remember that. Now, think about the language of Exodus 28, 20 verse 8 for me. Here's what God said about the timing of it. Remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. And they understood that correctly, that every Saturday that came around, they were to remember the Sabbath. Parallel to the New Testament, on the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. What week? What are we talking about? Well, friend, the parallel to the Sabbath, and when God tells us to remember something on a day of the week, that's every day of that week, or every week. And so as we think about this idea, when God told them to remember the Sabbath, that was every Saturday. Remember the first day of the week? That's every first day of the week. Every Sunday in the first century, Christians would come together to remember the Lord's death and to worship Him. Acts 2 verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. They're following the pattern set forth by the church and the apostles. And that pattern includes Acts 20 verse 7. But here's something interesting. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 26 teaches us, we're to remember the Lord's death. We, 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 are, we proclaim as often as we take the Lord's Supper, we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. And so there was an oftenness to them doing that. We might ask, how often did Christians come together in 1 Corinthians? A well, friend, we need to look no further than 1 Corinthians 16. As we read in the New American Standard and English Standard Version, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2, Paul says, As I gave orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also on the first day of every week. Let each one of you lay by in store as he prospered. Now, let's put some things together here. There was an oftenness, according to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26. The, one of the major reasons they came together was for the taking of the Lord's Supper. Acts 20, verse 7. How often did they come together? Every first day of the week. Now, let's put that together. Christians came together for the purpose of taking the Lord's Supper. They came together on the first day of the week, every first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2. And they proclaimed the Lord's death until He came through their oftenness of gathering together. Friend, does that not serve as a great pattern for us today? I often hear people say, when we talk about the Lord's Supper, that... Uh, they took a little, well, for us today, we can take of it once a month. So we do it once a month. We do it once a quarter. 
We do it because it's special on Christmas and Easter. But friend, does not the Bible teach? Christians came together every first day of the week and a part of their coming together was to partake of the Lord's Supper. If that's the case, then we today need to come together every first day of the week to partake of the Lord's Supper. And how often, how long should that continue? Well, according to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26, that continues until He comes. And so an identifying characteristic of the Lord's church is we partake the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. That's the pattern we find in the New Testament. Now, as we think about then continuing ideas relating to the Lord's Supper, let's also realize that there is a certain amount of remembrance. There are reminders. The Lord's Supper serves as a reminder and helps us to remember certain things. I want you to notice in your Bible, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 through 26 with me. The Bible says this, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so when we think about the Lord's Supper, it's an opportunity to remember the Lord's death. It's an opportunity to remember His sacrifice. It's an opportunity to remember what He did for us. I reflect on His life, how wonderful that was, what He gave up for me, and how great of an example that is. Now, moving on to chapter 12, 12 from our discussion of the Lord's Supper, we also want to think about some ideas that Paul mentions in chapter 12 as he is now going to move to another problem. There were some problems related to the Lord's Supper, and Paul addressed those. Now, in chapters 12 through 14, there are going to be some problems related to miraculous gifts. And friend, this is such a, a practical lesson today because so many get caught up in the miraculous. And friend, the major teaching that Paul begins with is God doesn't want us to be ignorant about miracles and the miraculous. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 1. Paul says this, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. The Bible is given so that we can know God and know how to please Him. And friend, there are just too many people, so many people who get caught up in false ideas about miracles and the miraculous, which are not taught in the Bible. The Bible teaches that miracles had a specific purpose. Mark chapter 16, verse 20, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, teach that miracles were given to confirm the Word of God and that there were different gifts given to different peoples. There were many gifts given, but they were all given by God's Spirit. Uh, chapter 12, verses 4 through 6 teaches, and the Spirit gave those gifts for the profit of all people. That is, so that all people could day, today could learn from and profit from those gifts. And so we're going to think more in our next lesson uh, about some very clear teaching about miracles from chapters 13 and 14. How long were miracles to last? What was their specific purpose? Did everybody have a miracle? Is, and think about this big question. Is there anything more important than miracles? Chapter 13 teaches there absolutely is. And we're going to notice that as well in our next lesson. But the purpose of miracles was to help the church. And friend, Paul teaches that the church is one body. And that body is the people. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 20, You are the body of Christ and many members individually, one of another. Verse number 12, chapter 12, verse number 27. And as we think about this idea, those miracles were given to help the church grow and mature, but once they reach a point of spiritual maturity and where they have the complete revealed Word of God, we're going to leave the, the partial behind the miracles, and we're going to move on to that which is even better, the complete revealed will and word of God. And so we want to encourage you to join us as we're going to think more about God's teaching on miracles next time. But friend, there's also a very powerful lesson taught about how to get in the church.
of the Lord Jesus Christ in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. I want you to look at this point with me. How does one get in the body of Christ? That'd be a great question that we want to answer, ask and answer from the Scriptures. Notice 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. The Bible says, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slave or free, and all have been made to drink into one Spirit. How do you get into the body of the Lord Jesus Christ? By one Spirit, we're baptized into the one body. The Spirit, the Word of God, the Spirit revealed the Word of God to us. And through the Spirit's teaching, we learn how to get into the kingdom. Jesus taught us that. John 3, verse 5, Jesus said, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Uh, John 3, verses 3 through 5, the kingdom is the church. Acts chapter 2, verse 47, Mark chapter 9, verse 1. And thus, to get into God's kingdom, you must be a member, you must be baptized into the church. Now, take just a moment to think about that plan of salvation just a little more in depth. The Bible teaches to become a Christian, to get into the church, you've got to hear the Word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Once I've heard that message, I've, I've studied the Scripture, uh, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, I've got to have faith in that and believe it. Unless you believe that I am He, Jesus said, you'll surely die in your sins, John 8, verse 24. Having believed the message of Christ, I must repent of sin. Acts 3, 19, Peter said, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Having repented, I must make that good confession. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Uh, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. And yes, the Bible teaches to be saved, I must be baptized. Peter stood up and said in Acts 2, verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. And so, friend, if you've never obeyed the gospel we want to encourage you to do that today. We want you to know that God loves you, we love you, and we hope you'll join us next time as we study more from the Word of God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go. Gospel of Christ.